You know, reading this latest book of yours and having read some of your others uh, and seen very learned and technically precise descriptions of computer science, of the workings of DNA, of natural selection, and other topics like that, I'm always wondering, why didn't you become a scientist? Oh, I suppose I didn't become a scientist or an engineer, which in some ways would have fit me better, just because I was uh, headed in the direction of the humanities by my family, uh, which was all uh, people in the humanities. My father was a historian. My mother was an English teacher. And I um, fell in love with philosophy as an undergraduate. And that more or less determined my uh, trajectory, although no sooner did I become a graduate student than I became deeply interested in uh, uh, what became neuroscience and psychology and uh, uh, almost shifted fields right then and there. And I should add that the evidence of science, the empirical facts of science, play a big part in your philosophy. I mean, for instance, natural selection you know, is one of your guiding ideas, and you are constantly integrating um, the latest findings from various fields into your thinking about the world. So it did lead me to, to wonder, gee, this guy has such a scientific bent. Uh, why not go in that direction? On the other hand, you point out that those scientists, and there, there are a few very famous ones, who dismiss philosophy altogether, who make statements like uh, philosophy is to science what pigeons are to statues, are um, prone to all kinds of errors in thinking. You know, I think it needs both fields. I, um, I think it needs philosophically astute scientists and scientifically astute philosophers. Uh, there's enough work for both schools, and I'm, I'm happy where I am for several reasons. <laughs> One is I never have to do the dishes. <laughs> I get to discuss all the experiments and even sometimes design them. Uh, um, but uh, I, uh, although I participate in the lab. I don't usually have to do all the hard scut work. <laughs> but you say you, uh, you actually get a certain amount of delight out of watching scientists make conceptual errors because of a lack of attention to philosophical principles. Can you give me some examples? Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> um, well, if you look carefully and skeptically at a lot of the work that's been done on consciousness, by neuroscientists, you'll find that a lot of it makes what we might call the television fallacy. They've got a pretty good uh, theory of how you could get television <laughs> inside the brain, but not vision. Mm -hmm. They think there's, that the end product is something like a movie picture in the middle of the head, um, but of course it isn't. And they haven't really thought hard about what the end product of perception is, if not a moving picture in your head. Uh, or another case that's even more egregious and the one that I've been working on recently is the really, um, I think, clumsy statements about free will that have been coming out of the neurosciences and the psychology recently. Um, these really don't stand up to scrutiny at all. And, and I think that's really unfortunate because when a scientist in his or her white lab coat standing in front of an array of lab equipment says, uh, science has shown that we don't have free will. They better know what they're talking about <laughs> because when people take that seriously, it can really, it can blight their lives. Uh, yeah, if, if people really bought into it, uh, they might imagine that they no longer have a choice in anything and can do whatever they please without responsibility. No. Um, you said a moment ago that, of course, the real problem of vision is not solved by a statement that a movie screen is erected in your head and, and an image uh, cast upon it. One problem with that is that if you simply translate you know, sensory data into an image in the head, then you've, you're back to the original problem of who then decodes that image and perceives it. That's exactly right. Um, what uh, a lot of scientists, I think, haven't really got their head around, they think they've they postponed the problem of consciousness. If you really postpone the problem, then you're not working on perception at all. You, you've got to somehow get it into your theory that the work of comprehension, of discrimination, of deciding what to do about what you're being informed about, 
that has to come along right from the get-go. And uh, if you postpone all of that later work until after the show is presented in the inner theater, then you've just <laughs> missed the boat. You don't have a theory at all. I want to get to both consciousness and free will. A tall order for a radio program, but I do want to get to both those things uh, in the interview. But I want to start down that path by creating a, a straw man. And in fact, I th I'd like to call him Straw Dan. Okay. And he is the Daniel Dennett that I think some people imagine, who is the uh, arch materialist. He's a guy who thinks that the world is nothing but physics, nothing but matter and energy bouncing around and going on their mindless way. And from these processes, uh, everything we need to know can be extracted. That the idea that there are, oh, things like mind or spirit or self, these are all illusions, that it is really just a bunch of mechanics. Yeah, that's a common enough caricature. And like any good caricature, there's enough of an element of truth in it that uh, that it's not just immediately dismissible. Um, uh, I was once interviewed by uh, Giulio Giorello, a very fine Italian philosopher of science and journalist, and uh, in the paper the next day, the, the headline was in Italian, Si, abbiamo un'anima mai fatta di tanti piccoli robot. Yes, we have a soul, but it's made of lots of tiny robots. <laughs> and uh, I thought, you know, that's pretty close. That's, uh, that's my motto. Yes, we have a soul. <laughs> but it's made of lots of tiny robots. It's not made of anything else. It's not as if there was some special mind stuff in there that it was made of. Um, and the trick is to understand how you can take lots of tiny robots, motor proteins and parts of neurons, uh, and neurons themselves, how you can put them into teams and armies that can both collaborate and compete to create all the wonders of the mind. And when they do that right... They create an organization, and it's that organization that has the properties that we trip, typically assign to the soul. If you didn't have that organization, then you wouldn't have a soul. You'd be, you'd be either a demented or a too young. Uh, you'd be juvenile. You would be uh, not yet adult enough to, to be morally responsible. But if you want to know what makes a person responsible and dignified and lovable and a worthy object of our admiration and friendship, then it's the organization of all of that matter. And uh, you don't want to explain that in terms of atoms or even molecules. Proteins, that's too low a level, but that's, what, that's what's doing the work, is protein. Well, we can see how you could go from particles to atoms and from atoms to molecules and from simple molecules to really complex molecules that seem to be acting on their own. If you magnify what's going on in a cell, you will see these motor proteins moving around as if by intention. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. You will see DNA replicating. You will see enzymes reading sec segments of DNA, translating them into proteins, and, uh, and those proteins going off and doing work. You'll see things that almost look like conscious agents. But then we know that can't be true. Those are little machines. So you put a bunch of cells together, uh, and you say, well, now it's doing more complex things, but it's still just a machine. A lot of your book is focused on describing that ladder up from simplicity to complexity, yeah. up to something we could call a self, up to something we could even call consciousness uh, and agency. Um, I want you to take us through a few steps. I think, the, again, the simple take on all of this is a machine is a machine is a machine. No matter how complicated it gets, it will always be nothing but a bunch of parts moving mindlessly together and at best creating the illusion of intelligence of a knowing subject. That's the best it can do. Well, um, that idea that no matter how much you pile on of this, it's always just going to be an illusion is the one that we have to look closely at. Uh, at what point does it cease to be an illusion and become the plain truth? Let's take a simpler case. Do colors exist? 
is there such a thing as as a as a red apple or as a as a, a yellow banana or a, a, you know a blue marble? Of course they do. Um, but if you look closely enough, a blue marble is not made of blue atoms. Atoms don't have a color. For that matter, molecules don't really have a color. It's only larger things that have colors. Now, does that mean it's illusory? I don't think so. Um, the fact that things aren't colored all the way down doesn't mean they're not colored. And the fact that consciousness isn't made of parts that are conscious, that are made of parts that are conscious, that are made of parts that are conscious, we have many examples of uh, larger things, more complicated things, that have properties in virtue of that complexity that their parts don't have. And the two most important ones, to me, are free will and consciousness. We have free will even though our parts don't. <laughs> and we have consciousness even though our parts don't. What our parts have is sort of like free will. It's sort of free. It's sort of conscious. And we have to understand how this... Uh, cascade of intermediate cases can actually yield the real thing. Uh, again, the the simple reaction to that is, well, where is the threshold crossed? Um, if we follow it really, really closely from the elementary building blocks up through the more complex components to the machine in its entirety, we see no place where sudden, suddenly exactly. the miracle happens. <laughs> We don't see a place, and, and this is a mistake. This is a very common mistake to think that there has to be, uh, you know, a bell rings or the light flashes, and suddenly we're in an entirely different realm. It doesn't work that way. Um, uh, one of my favorite thought experiments in, uh, in intuition bumps is uh, uh, beware of the prime mammal. Um, it looks for all the world as if, you know, every mammal, a defining feature of every mammal is to have a mammal for a mother. If you're not born of a mammal, you can't be a mammal. So let's say every mammal has a mammal for a mother. Now we've got a problem because that implies either there have never been any mammals or there's been an infinity of mammals. Well, but does there have to be a first mammal, the prime mammal, the first and only mammal that didn't have a mammal for a mother? No. There are lots of intermediates, and we could baptize any one of those intermediates you want and say, well, this is the first mammal. But that would be arbitrary. It would not be justified. We can go from non-mammal to mammal without any bell ringing, without any magic moment. Uh, there's lots of characteristics that mammals have that reptiles don't have. Uh, no set of those no subset of those characteristics is the essence of mammalhood. And it doesn't have to be an essence. But it's very hard for people to think that way when they've been trained or encouraged to think that everything has an essence. Um, yeah, so let's take that, that sort of gradualist approach and look at the classic example of a thing that seems to be approaching a level that we would call thought, a computer. Mm -hmm. uh, are you saying then that a computer, though none of us would ascribe to it the level of awareness that a human being has, are you saying it's partially conscious? I mean, the, the more sophisticated ones? Yeah. Let's say Watson. Yeah. Is Watson partially conscious? Um, partially, very, very partially. <laughs> I think there are um, robots that are in some ways more interestingly conscious than Watson. How so? Um in that they uh, fend for themselves, they they have some uh, capacity to be uh, uh, not just alert to their changes in their surroundings, but we might say troubled by <laughs> novelties in their surroundings. They take on a little bit of the task of protecting themselves and guiding themselves through life the way an animal does. Uh, Watson is uh, uh, entirely bedridden and... Uh, uh, cared for, and uh, doesn't really need to be conscious of its surroundings. Although it does um, uh, uh, respond in its very bedridden way to all the information that's constantly pouring into it. 
Now, now here's a way of thinking that I think you'll quickly um, take issue with. You know, a computer, yes, can manifest results that we humans find very significant. After all, we have mapped onto its circuits and onto its, uh, you know, logic gates all kinds of things that we care about, and we understand that the patterns it produces, let's say, on a display screen, which are nothing more than pixels, we understand that to us they represent numbers or images or other things that we really care about. The computer doesn't know any of that. The computer is nothing but this device that can manipulate bits of information in ways that we tell it to. For it to mean anything, there has to be a perceiver to whom things mean, and that is us. So I think what I'm saying is, is a version of what's called original intentionality, that the real thinking subject, me, is what makes things meaningful, that the device that performs computation isn't making any sort of meaning at all. Well, I think that's what I meant about robots. Uh, Watson is parasitic on us. We're the observers. We're the interpreters. Yeah. And all of Watson's uh, activities are are designed to, as, as it were, present material to us. Um, what would it take to take us out of the equation and have a suitable observer, perceiver, user there? Well, if we if we gave Watson to a robot that had to fend for itself in the world. And Watson became the eyes and ears of this robot. We'd have to give it television cameras and uh, microphones. And then this is a robot that could fend for itself. And uh, if it didn't want to go on Jeopardy, it would, it would uh, negotiate with us. And it would have needs. Now we've taken us as the, as the uh, perceiver, observer, appreciator out of the equation and turned that in, over to another agent, namely a giant robot. <coughs> now we have a we have a suitable interpreter of meaning for all that stuff that, that, that Watson does. And it might be just wonderful. It might be that Watson was the, a wonderful uh, front end, if you like, on this uh, even larger robot. Certainly the... Uh, uh, a robot that could get about in the world um, the way science fictional robots do would have to have something <laughs> at least as wonderful as Watson as part of its input an- analyzing equipment. So I guess we've got a definition of meaning there. You say that when you know the kind of uh, information that Watson supplies is put into action, by this robot, mm-hmm. in, in functional ways, in ways that seem, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick the word seem in there for now, that seem to be purposeful, that now we have significance and meaning springing up in what might have been thought of as sort of brute physical processes. I think that is one of the trickiest things you attempt to do in your work and in this book, is to describe how meaning originates in stuff. Meaning without some ready-made thinking subject like you and me giving the world meaning, that meaning arises can arise in physics. <laughs> well, it can arise. It can arise in biology. Arise in biology. That is, as soon as you get living things, how, however simple, as simple as a bacterium. A, a bacterium, in fact, must divide its environment into the, the good stuff and the bad stuff. The stuff that helps it live and the stuff that is a uh, harm or toxic or thwarts its desire to reproduce. Does it have a real desire? Well, it acts as if it has a real desire. It, but it's, it's already beginning to partition the impingements on its surface as the stuff that it should welcome and the stuff that it should shun. That's the beginning of meaning right there. It starts to have reasons for doing things. It, it doesn't have reasons. There are reasons for it to do things. And as life becomes more complicated, we get more and more elaborate and sophisticated responses to the world built into plants, uh, more complicated organisms. You don't really get serious 
reasoning until you get to human beings. You have animals that do things for reasons, and that's a kind of meaning, but they don't have to appreciate the reasons. I'm actually fairly uh, uh, radical on this score. I think that human beings have reasons for what they do, and it's arguable that we're the only organisms that do. We represent the reasons to each other and to ourselves. Dogs do things for reasons, but do they understand that they're doing things for reasons? That's that's a hard one. Um, it, it's it's marginal. It's worth it's worth asking the question. So you're saying the universe, from say the time of the Big Bang to just a couple billion years ago, at least uh, as far as we know here on Earth, during that those many billions of years when it was lifeless really was meaningless that yep. the uh, you know the motions of the planets and the stars and all of those cosmological processes lacked meaning until life formed uh, and things started doing what we would call purposeful actions yeah and that too was a gradual build up we move from utter meaninglessness and just sheer matter in motion just the caricature with which you began that's the universe of Atoms and molecules shifting about. But even there, there are patterns that begin to build more patterns and begin to create regularities and eventually create feedback processes. You have all these cycles interacting. Still, there's no meaning. Still, there's no purpose. But once you reach the point where you have entities that have ways of reacting to the surrounding environment in ways that further their own prolongation and eventually replication. Now we're beginning to get the extraction of information from the world, the surrounding world, and the utility of that information, the use of that information. Once you have entities that use information about their world to further their own careers, uh -huh. then you have meaning. Um, you know, first of all, let's just note that we have started dismantling straw Dan right there. It's not all physics, you're saying. You are not a physicalist in the really basic sense. It's biology. Yeah. It's biology. Yeah, yeah. That was the main message of, of my book, Freedom Evolves, too. If you want to know what science is relevant to whether we have free will, it's not physics, it's biology. And, of course, it's Darwin who shows us how biology comes out of physics. Yeah. Uh, and comes out of rules that are themselves not even physical rules. Uh, how would you describe natural selection as, as a kind of algorithm or as a set of rules? Natural selection is a family of sorting algorithms. And there are sorting algorithms that are not natural selection and it's worth distinguishing them. Um, if you want a simple example, just go down to the beach and watch the ocean waves sort the sand and the pebbles by size. That's a sorting algorithm. Relentless cycles of back and forth will gradually uh, create some otherwise improbable patterns in the, in the sand. Mm -hmm. Many such sorting processes occur without life. And if they didn't, life would be impossible because life depends on highly improbable patterns that have some staying power. Once you get patterns with staying power, patterns that have feedback so that they can protect themselves against dissolution, against dissipation. Now we're on the road to life, and once we get to life, we have meaning. We have information. I have a new definition of semantic information, not Shannon Weaver information theory information, but what, what people are talking about when they're talking about information processing in the brain. And my, my bumper sticker for it is specs worth stealing. Specs <laughs> in the sense of specifications. Every organism lives or dies because it meets or doesn't meet its the specifications for such a self-protective entity. 
this is a very clearly an engineering perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, what Darwinian evolution does is, having achieved those specs in a few cases, then other things that can copy those specs do well. And so those are valuable specs. They're worth stealing. And so life is the sort of principle of universal plagiarism. <laughs> when we think of natural selection, we think of uh, a genome, essentially, that, that, that has variations from time to time. And those variations, some of them help the organism survive and reproduce and multiply. And those are the variations that will be preserved and added to over time. And you get an accumulation of these innovations and you know, lo and behold, you have complex organisms over time. Where's the stealing? Ah, that's the copying. Oh, the copying. So all, one... the, all, the, all the mutations, all the innovations that, that go extinct are, were not worth stealing. Bringing in the idea of theft or, or purchase is actually useful because it brings in the idea of value added. The point is that this is, this is not just any old pattern. This is a valuable pattern. This is a pattern that is valuable for preserving or enhancing the interests of a little agent or quasi-agent. When a a genome replicates, when uh, an organism gives rise to an offspring, um, you're calling that theft in a way. Yes, in the following sense. If you adopt the perspective of, say, a patent attorney, and you ask yourself, what is a patentable idea? Not any old idea is worthy of a patent. You can't copyright three notes. There has to be a value to the innovation, such that in our law-abiding society, it, it's something that can be protected so that if you want it, you got to buy it. If you get it without buying it, then you're stealing it. Well, there aren't any currencies in natural selection. So uh, there's a lot of appropriation by theft, and there's a lot of appropriation that just sort of comes with the territory, but only the good stuff gets appropriated. Um, I want to back up to the, the big point we made a moment ago about the way meaning enters the universe through biology and through the appearance of organisms that seem to have purposes and ends and needs um, that they pursue. What's funny about that is that scientists uh, in evolutionary biology at least try to pay lip service to the idea of not being teleological, of not talking about purposes, because after all, natural selection is just pure statistics. It says that whatever you know has the best odds of surviving is likely to proliferate, Right. So instead of talking about some particular adaptation, quote-unquote, in an animal as being for this purpose or that purpose, you could just say that's just the, the most likely outcome. That's all it is, right? Yeah. So don't talk about the interests of the organism so much, uh, you know, if you really want to be strict. Let's just talk in purely mechanistic and mathematical terms about these things. I take it you are opposed to that idea of su- right. sucking saying, teleology out of it. That's right. I'm saying that that sort of hyper-Puritanism was an overreaction. And we should relax, we should undo it, and we should recognize that nobody really lives by that anyway. <laughs> look through the, not just the popular articles, look through the peer-reviewed literature of biology. Look through the peer-reviewed literature in cell biology, in developmental biology, in microbiology, in, in biochemistry, <laughs> Uh, and everywhere you look, you'll find function, function, function. Absolutely. Jolly good thing that it's there, too, because people are doing reverse engineering of every phenomenon in nature. And when you're doing reverse engineering, you're helping yourself to the assumption that if you see something that's hanging around for a long time, it's not just you say it's probable. Well, actually, from the point of view of physics, it's improbable. Every last one of those structures is as unlikely as all get out. (laughs) And the reason that it exists, the reason it exists, is because it helps some agent prolong its life. And uh, there's reasons 
everywhere. I call them free-floating rationales, and nature is imbued with reasons at every scale from the level of the molecule on up to the level of societies and their culture. I think this would be a good time to ask you about a more technical point. Um, We talked about the fact that there's no strict threshold, there's no bright line between unintelligent and intelligent, between non-thinking and thinking, between non-conscious and conscious. But there are some important um, categories uh, that you introduce in the way we have to think about certain things in order to describe them accurately. We can describe physical processes with something you call the physical stance, Mm -hmm. right? We can use math and physics to describe everything we need to know about things at a certain level. But at a higher level, when they get more complicated, we have to change to something you call, uh, and I'm saying you say we have to change, to something you call the intentional stance. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Well, I say there's actually three stances. Yes, I skipped Uh, one. The (laughs) physical stance, the design stance, and the intentional stance. The physical stance is just physics. And we can describe everything at the everything physical at the physical stance. And sometimes that's appropriate. If you're, you know, falling out of a, a, a tall building, the intentional stance is really not needed to predict your trajectory. So gravity will pretty well take care of it. Of course, if you're a bird and you have wings, then we have to start thinking about the design stance and the intentional stance because you probably want to live and you're probably going to fly away instead of landing on the ground. The design stance is what you use when you're going to reverse engineer anything, whether it's an artifact or a living thing. Um, and But if it's, if it's a, a, a pine tree, uh, you don't really have to use the intentional stance, which is the one that attributes something more like a mind. Even a pine tree, however, you can make sense of some of its goings-on by adopting the intentional stance because there are reasons why the pine tree does what it does, even if it doesn't appreciate those reasons, even if it doesn't have a mind or a nervous system. But the intentional stance is in the first place uh, the stance we use to predict and explain the choices made by reasoners on the basis of their beliefs and desires. And this is agent talk par excellence, but it also has extended uses when we think about the designs that we find in nature that have never been appreciated by any mind until some human being came along and figured them out. So the intentional stance starts with the assumption that we have an intelligent agent who has certain beliefs about the world and certain goals, certain desires, certain purposes, and that will make the moves that best, by its lights, serve those goals. And it's, um, I just named it, it's, it's, it's the heart of classical economics, it's the heart of literary interpretation, it's the heart of folk psychology, it's how come we're so good at understanding and not being surprised by the behavior we see of our fellow human beings around us. Now, here again, you are not the reductionist you're supposed to be. You're saying that it is not a matter of us just simply not knowing enough physics. Uh, and if we knew enough physics, we could describe everything from molecules to human beings to human societies. And uh, we'd miss something. <laughs> and we'd miss something fundamental. At some point... As things get more complicated, we have to, we absolutely have to attribute to them some kind of, uh, as you say, agency, some kind of selfhood, some kind of, you know, goal-oriented behavior, intelligence, lots of different ways of saying it. Um, And one of my intuition pumps in the book is a rather contrived example, which is precisely designed to show what you leave out if you only have the physical stance, what you, what you cannot explain. And that is the thought experiment about the two black boxes that are connected to each other, and you push a button on one box and, and a red light goes on. You push a different button on the first box, and a green light goes on on the other box. 
Now, there's a physical regularity. You'd want to give it a causal explanation. But the way I've contrived the case, the only causal explanation that can explain that regularity is one that involves the intentional stance. You have to understand the meaning of the signaling that's going on between the two boxes. You have to Basically, you have to attribute beliefs and desires to the two boxes to understand this behavior. Now, let's explain for our radio audience, for whom this part of the discussion is itself probably a black box at this point. <clears throat> Indeed it is. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> this is a thought experiment, and it's, it's, it's a really fascinating one, in which you, um, you know, contrive two imaginary black boxes that are connected, and one has a, a set of buttons and the other has a set of lights. And by pushing um, one button or the other, you can get one or another light to go on. It turns out that uh, the pattern there is really, really hard to figure out. You know, it's really hard to figure out an underlying basis for that pattern until you know what's actually going on inside these boxes. And what's actually going on inside the boxes is? The thing of it, if you like, is rather like... IBM's Watson. Each one of them has a giant storehouse of truth about the world. They're computers with huge databases. And when you press the alpha button on, on the first box, it chooses a truth at random and sends it down the wire to the other box, which evaluates it for truth. And if it thinks it's true, it pushes, uh, turns on the, the green light. Otherwise, it turns on the red light. So in a way, it's very simple. Uh, but, but the point is that you have to understand that the, the pattern of voltages that's going down the wire has to be evaluated for truth or falsity. You have to know the meaning of the symbols. You have to know the language in which the code is sent in order to interpret it, in order to decide whether it's true or false. And if you, you could be a Martian Laplacian scientist, you could know everything about physics. You could trace the electrons running through these two boxes, and you would still not be able to predict, wh explain why pressing the alpha button causes the red light to go on and pressing the beta button causes the green light to go on. You would not be able... I think I've got the colors reversed. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to explain that regularity, even though you'd be able to explain each particular case. That is, your... From the physical stance, you trace through every atom's motion from one to the other, and you and you'd be able to say, yeah, yeah, I can understand why the red light went on, but why does it always go on when I press this button and never goes on when I press that button? That's the fact which would stand out like a sore thumb that can't be explained. And it's like the explanation, suppose we want to know, you know why giraffes have these long necks? Well, if you had an atom-for-atom atom description of the trajectory of every giraffe since before there were giraffes until today, you would have a humongous database, but you wouldn't have an explanation of that fact at that level. You have to go to the level of ecology, and you have to look at the life histories and the predator patterns and the possibilities and the survival rates of offspring, you have to go to the level of biology to explain why the giraffes have long necks. It's the same issue. Now, I just want to understand the black box thing a little better. Um, you have two boxes. Each of them is referring to what you could call a gigantic database of facts, right? Yep. Um, and one is sending a fact to the other, and the other is saying, yeah, I recognize that fact. It's true. Yep. Uh, or, no, it's not true. It doesn't match my database. Now, isn't that just simple pattern matching? Why do we have to talk about anything other than, again, just brute, you know, mechanical process there? Why do we have to introduce the idea of purpose and meaning? Um, only because of the way I've set up the example. Um, the two boxes have completely different databases written in different computer languages. So if you want to talk about pattern matching, the only patterns that match are the patterns of truth and falsehood. Ah. <laughs> um, that's the trick there. Now, if they both wrote all their facts in, you know, prologue to take a computer language that is pretty good at representing facts, and they all use the same dialect of prologue, then it would be a simple 
um, checking bits and just matching bit for bit and, and, and checking it for truth in, in that system. But, but I deliberately set it up so it was much more complicated so that you couldn't revert to a simple pattern match. How has the world responded to that thought experiment? Uh, yeah, it, it's funny in a way. I published the first version of that in my book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, and it was really aimed at a, a, a coterie of philosophers who have scratched their heads for years about this very issue. And I don't think those philosophers read the book because um, there was almost no reaction from these professionals to that thought experiment. Uh, maybe I should have published a much more turgid version in a peer-reviewed philosophy journal, then they would have had to take it seriously. Is it one of your favorites, though, that you've come up it with? It is. It's the one that I think is most subversive to a, a well-regarded philosophical topic, and I'm just hoping that philosophers will take it seriously now. But they may not, because they may decide, oh, that's just one of Dennett's um, uh, thought experiments, one of his intuition pumps for the lay public. It's not for us. Well, I'd like to see them answer it. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I got to say, I, my first instinct was to argue with it uh, a lot, you know, that it's simple pattern matching, that in the end, yeah, you've got the databases written in different languages, et cetera, but they're instantiating the same information ultimately. So you're really just fitting round pegs into round holes and square pegs into square holes and so on and so forth. But the way you just described it to me, well, I'm still scratching my head. I want to argue with it, though, and I have a lot of instincts to argue with some of the things you propose in this book because um, while you elegantly and persuasively uh, lay out this, this case for things like meaning and consciousness arising through this process that we've just described uh, of greater complexity where purpose and uh, agency enter the equation, what you dispel uh, or dismiss is the one thing that people most want to discuss, which is subjectivity, right? I mean, the, the, what we really are talking about here in the end isn't that, yes, you can create a robot or a mechanism that looks just like it's purposeful, that looks just like it's a human being even, that looks just like it's full of intention and awareness and self-consciousness. But in the end, you're still lacking a subject. You're still lacking the interior spark, the thusness, you call it, in one place. The, I am feeling this. The, you know, all, well, of the, all of the things for which we have lousy the words. The zombic hunch. The zombic hunch, yes. Let's talk about the zombic hunch. <laughs> tell me what it means and tell me why people like me are so attached to it and why we're wrong. The philosophical use of the term zombie is, I think, uh, deeply problematic because everybody has trouble distinguishing it sufficiently from the idea of zombies, which is now very current in the movies. We have a movie, the... Uh, World War Z, which is all about zombies. That's not the kind of zombies that philosophers talk about. <laughs> right. Philosopher zombies are indistinguishable from human beings behaviorally by any test, by any test at all. That's by definition. In other words, um, every movie you've ever seen that's realistic and that doesn't purport to be about zombies is indistinguishable from a movie about zombies. You know, War and Peace, they're all zombies. You, you name it, it's about zombies. This is, I think, a, a, should be viewed as a disreputable concept. Uh, it's a difference that makes no difference. Let's just simplify it by saying we're talking about some mindless entity that appears to be just like us, acts just like us, and no matter how we poke it and prod it and interrogate it, it is precisely like us. Uh, except there's nobody home. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, uh, one of the exercises I, I encourage people to engage in in the book is try to imagine a philosophical zombie. Try to imagine writing a novel about a philosophical zombie. You find you can't do it. Or, <laughs> or if you can, uh, you don't have to do it because all the novels that have ever been written, no matter how much they go into the interior lives... Actually, <laughs> I suggested... Novelists that use the first-person narrative, or like Melville and Moby Dick, call me Ishmael. Then you get everything from Ishmael's point of view. That's easy enough to see that Ishmael can be a zombie, because all we ever get to see is what he tells us. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't look inside his mind. Mm -hmm. so, so if you think about the novels that 
um, actually look inside the minds of their characters, um, those would be the uh, novels that reportedly couldn't be about zombies, except for one thing. Anybody who thinks carefully about zombies for any length of time realizes that if they're not magical, if we're not just pretending to take them seriously, we have to realize that a philosophical zombie has to have one heck of a control system inside its head, between its ears, and that control system is going to be going through lots of unconscious states which are exactly parallel to human conscious states. In other words, if human beings have a stream of consciousness, human zombies, philosophical zombies, have a stream of unconsciousness, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. essentially indistinguishable. After all, remember, there is no behavioral test for zombiehood at all. In other words, zombies act as if they prefer one kind of ice cream to another. <laughs> they, they, they are just as averse to pain as any, as any normal human <laughs> being is, and so forth. Eventually, I think, uh, if you think about it hard and long enough, you realize that the very concept of a philosophical zombie is, is a, an incoherent concept. And uh, uh, whatever we think subjectivity is, we can get at it from the third-person point of view. After all, that's what we do. I think you're conscious because I'm having this very nice conversation with you. I, I, I think that that establishes your consciousness beyond a shadow of a doubt. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. So the problem of other minds, is, is that simply solved? I think the problem of other minds is dissolved rather than solved, yes. Well, tell me, Dan, we make a distinction in our own selves between unconscious and conscious. So we do a lot of things. And, you know, cognitive uh, scientists, psychologists, neuroscientists have basically uh, built a picture of an unconscious that does most stuff not just manage our bodily functions, but makes decisions, triggers actions and things like that, all outside of our so-called consciousness. And if we were to subtract what we call our so-called consciousness, this self-aware vantage we have on our own actions, if we were to subtract that, we still might be pretty functional in some ways. I mean, we wouldn't be good conversationalists, maybe, but it'd be interesting. Um, why do we... Well, look at all the cases that we actually... <laughs> that actually uh, 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 populate that imagined boundary. Ah, things imagined like, boundary. Things, things ah. like sleepwalking. Right, exactly, yeah. Let's look at sleepwalking for a minute. Sleepwalkers are actually quite readily distinguishable from awake walkers. And any sleepwalker that wasn't, neither you nor I would we simply wouldn't give credence to the claim that they were sleepwalking. In a longer conversation, I would I would build to this point much more slowly and carefully. So I'm just going to sort of lead with my chin here and say, think about it. If somebody went on, you know, David Letterman's show and had a high impact delicious repartee back and forth with David and then said afterwards to the press, you know, I was asleep the whole time. That was all. I was just sleep talking. I think we would think, well, I don't know what kind of joke he's trying to pull on us, <laughs> but I certainly don't believe it. <laughs> or, or a person under hypnosis, you know, following yeah. commands uh, and not even remembering what they did as soon as they snap out of it. Yeah, well, it's one thing not to remember. It's another thing not to have been conscious at the time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, some might think that the whole process by which you describe consciousness as a kind of operational thing, a thing that arises out of a set of relationships, right, between an agent and its environment, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it isn't located narrowly, you know, in one spot at yep, all. That's right. It's, it's, it's this whole network of things that have to happen to qualify as conscious, that it still leaves out that thing that a lot of us mean when we say consciousness, which is that subjectivity, and I, I found a phrase that you have that I really like, that special private glow of here I am-ness. Do you think there's any meaning at all to that thing that we all feel is so 
important that it may be the single most important thing about us, that we feel like a self, that we feel like an observer, that we feel like a, you know, a light going through the world, you know, or a receiver of I things. I think that that idea deserves very careful attention. But I think when it gets it, it in the end is dissolved into parts that can all be explained in those relational terms, that there's nothing more to it than that. So there is no hard line between the objective description of those relationships and the subjective experience <laughs> that results from those relationships. I mean, that's right. In that's right. There's no hard line. I think that right there, uh, let me put it in a slightly different context. It seems to people that conscious and unconscious divides the universe in two. There's things that are conscious and things that aren't. There's times when you're conscious, there's times when you aren't. And that there is no more fundamental or important distinction than that. Yes. That idea of the sort of bifurcation of the universe into the conscious and the unconscious is, I think, an artifact of bad theorizing. It's just wrong. There's sort of conscious of every imaginable kind. When we look at life, <clears throat> when we look at bacteria and single-celled amoebas in the light, we say, well, they're not conscious. I'm sure of that. No, they're, no. No, they're, they're, just, they're just sort of living robots. Yes. And then we move up a little bit and we get to starfish, worms, and we're not so sure, and ants look pretty clever. And up we go. And um, here's the question that... Here's the artifact coming at you. Ready? We think we know what it's like for us to be conscious. And so we say, gosh, I wonder if the ant has that. I wonder if the fish has that. And we think we know what we are pointing to in our minds when we say that. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is an artifact. Uh, that's a mistake right there. It's a mistake because it presupposes that what we are imagining our own consciousness to be, what we're thinking of our own consciousness as, has no decomposition into thousands of different talents which we can demonstrate either to be present or absent in the ant, in the fish, in the monkey. And that when we would exhausted all those cheap tricks, the idea that there's one more trick left over, which we're wondering about, that is an error, that's a, a mistake of subtraction. We're just not counting up wonders correctly. <laughs> the the starfish is more wonderful than the amoeba, and the lobster is more wonderful than the starfish, and the monkey is more wonderful than the lobster and so forth. And for that matter, the tree is more wonderful than the bacterium. And there's any number of brands of wonderfulness, any number of varieties of, of stupendous organization and sensitivity and discrimination. And the idea that in addition to all of those, there's this extra special something subjectivity, what distinguishes us from the zombie, that's an illusion. If it's an illusion, if it's a mistake, it's certainly one on which we have built a lot of our culture, a lot of our sense of the world. You know, it is, it is central. <laughs> to... No, I don't think it is. I don't think it is central. I think that all it's central is an idea which is a slightly deflated version of that idea. And? Uh, that is to say, um, there's, if, if we decided tomorrow, you know, then it's right, we're all just zombies. And the, zombies are no different from conscious human beings. Um, we would have to change nothing. 
not our law, not our customs, not our literature, not our art. Those all would be just the same. Really? Now, now, Dan, I would, I would have thought that maybe there would be some implication for morals and law. The idea that, you know, the sovereign inviolable self as this seat of rights and privileges and consideration and all of that, <clears throat> doesn't your view sort of diffuse meaning and value into the system itself? I mean, I'm almost tempted to call you like a Buddhist in a way. Uh, instead of this sort of godly notion of the self, you have this idea of meaning arising from all things working together. Well, well, the the idea of the self is the idea of the self as a center of narrative gravity. Mm. It's a simplification of a very complicated thing. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to make the mistake of thinking that the self is a thing any more than the center of gravity of a car is a thing. It's an abstraction. A very handy, very useful simplification, an idealization. And that's what a self is, too. And the idea of the moral self, the uh, maker of our moral decisions, the um, one to be held responsible, the place where the buck stops. Yes. This is a very important notion, but it's, it's a simplification, it's an abstraction. And our law does not depend on our being perfect moral angels. We are morally competent, good enough for government work when we meet certain standards, and that's enough to secure the uh, respect for law, the understanding of right and wrong, the uh, the kinds of free will worth wanting, they don't depend on our having any magical properties. Dan, we've left one little thing out uh, on the agenda that we uh, sort of set out earlier in the conversation, and that is free will. The usual dilemma or quandary that frames this question is simply that, hey, if the world is deterministic, if it is an absolutely precise and predictable procession of events based on physics... Is there any room for choice in that? Isn't the scientific worldview ultimately opposed to the idea that we are uh, determiners of our own fate and makers of our own choices? No, I think this is uh, one of the most important and most fundamental philosophical errors. The idea that a free choice could not be a determined choice, it seems so obvious to so many people that determinism and free will are incompatible, but they're not. They're perfectly compatible. In fact, we want our choices, the choices that matter, to be determined by what we think and by what we know and by what we believe and hold dear. And interestingly enough, there is even a trace of this in language we use. We sometimes say about a human being with with admiration, with respect, we say, she's so determined. <laughs> and, and we mean that as, as high praise. It means she can make her will happen. Good for her. And we all want to be determined in that sense. But then the idea that, yes, but we don't want the choice that is thus determining to be determined. Well, yes, we do. We want it to be determined by the way the world is. If only the world will vouchsafe us facts about the way the world is so that our rational minds can consider those facts and weigh them, all things considered, and then judge what we deem to be best. What could be better than being well-informed and then acting rationally on the basis of that information to further the values that you take most seriously? Now, nothing in that, what I've just said, uh, is incompatible with determinism. Now, if we're determined, then we're determined to be as rational as we are, and that's not perfect. So none of us is perfect, but we don't have to be perfect. Here's a little exercise. If all my choices are determined, then all my choices are what? Inevitable? No. <laughs> then they're determined. So what? Um, if you want to turn that 
praise into into something dire, you have to come up with something other than the tautology. If they're determined, they're determined. But what does that mean? Does it mean they're not my choices? No. Does it mean they're not the choices I wanted to make? No. Well, what then? Who, who am I in all of this? Who am I but a billiard ball, you know, bouncing in accordance with various collisions imposed on me? Well, actually, you're much more than a billiard ball. You're <laughs> you're the whole human being with an intact and operating nervous system, a host of memories, uh, traditions, education, aspirations, plans. You're a pretty big thing. Now, if you make yourself really small, you can externalize virtually everything. But don't make yourself really small. You're not really small. You're that whole big thing that you've become over the years. And that's why your parents and your friends and your teachers went to all that trouble to give you a proper upbringing and a moral education so that big, wonderful, complicated thing that you are now, you can be a worthy bearer of responsibility for the deeds you perform. You've, to some degree, made yourself to be what you are. Now, if you were to make a robot and send it out into the world and that robot did some harm, you'd be responsible. You made that robot. Well, if you make yourself and you go out in the world and you do some harm, then you're responsible. You made yourself who you are. Well, with that in mind, Dan, uh, I'm going to try to be responsible and and let you get back to your life. What are you going to do with the rest of the day? Well, I'm working on the manuscript that Linda Lascola and I are writing up about the clergy who get into their lives as clergy and then discover they don't believe anymore and the traps that they get into um, as non-believing clergy. Is that going to be a book? It's going to be a short book, yeah. Well, I hope we can discuss it when it uh, comes out. Well, I hope so, too. Daniel Dennett is Austin B. Fletcher, professor of philosophy at Tufts University. His latest book is Intuition Pumps and Other Tools for Thinking. And yes, uh, folks, I did say at the beginning of the show that it was going to be an awful lot to cram into one tidy hour, which is all we had because Dan was on the clock. Now, if we had had longer, I would have pressed harder on some of those questions, which I fear we begged in the interest of time. Well, the only thing left to do is to try and try again, which I plan to do on future editions of the 7th Avenue Project. I hope you'll join me then. And, of course, you can always listen to past shows online at 7thAvenueProject.com and iTunes. And the captain of our ship is called Daniel C. Dennett, C. Daniel Dennett. Daniel C. Dennett, C. Daniel Dennett. Daniel C. Dennett. Dennett. 